instructional call to both the Ghana and the New York bar. Uh, she's the senior associate of Sam Obuzeto and Associates, uh, one of the leading law firms in Ghana. Uh, Diana is also a professor and lecturer in law at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, teaching ADR, uh, company law, uh, public international law, human rights. Uh, Diana is a World Bank certified trainer in corporate governance and also in human rights and ADR. And she has done, of course, a lot of trainings uh, for lawyers and judges in Ghana, uh, and also in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Uh, areas of research include ADR, corporate law, um, corporate law governance, human rights, and um, business and international relations. Um, well, it's a special privilege to have uh, Diana. Uh, Diana, of course, we, we got a great news recently. Diana is the um, Deputy Minister of Justice and um, Attorney General designate for Ghana. Uh, Diana, is, it's a special privilege to have you to speak to us today. Um, hopefully, we'll still be able to drag you <laughs> um, subsequently uh, for more sessions. Uh, but of course, you may now have the floor. Thank you, Diana. I thank you very much, Abayomi, for that very generous introduction. The way you and Nani are excited, I am fortified in my opinion that you conspired to get me into this very, hum I mean, humbling of it. So I would, I would, I would revenge in my own ways very soon. Let me say good morning to all the participants. It's always such a pleasure to share the same platform with Nania, with Abayomi and Kenneth. And I would, I would like to thank all participants for indulging us up to this time. I believe that um, Nania and Kenneth and in, of course Abayomi, they've done most of the work for me. My task here this morning is to speak to you about arbitral institutions in Ghana. I, I just joined in at the latter part and I saw Nania speak to you about, I mean, basic things on arbitration. And so give me just um, a few seconds while I share uh, my screen with you. So Abayomi has summoned me here um, to speak to you about uh, the essence of ADR and arbitral institutions. I believe I do not have to belabor the point much, but basically my session today will cover the following. One, the benefits of ADR. Two, what is arbitration? And I believe um, Nania has done a very good job on that. I'm going to speak to you about um, essence of arbitral institutions. And based on that, I'm going to talk about what we call ad hoc arbitration and institutional arbitration, just for you to appreciate more the essence of um, arbitral institutions administering arbitrations on your behalf between you and um, any other party where there is an arbitration um, agreement between you. I'm also going to introduce you to some arbitral institutions in Ghana. We're going to look at the advantages of institutional arbitration. And finally, I'll end my session with introducing you to the basic modalities in using arbitral institutions. Basically, the last legs is to answer the question, so what, what do I do? if I have drafted an arbitration um, agreement or clause and there's an arbitration and I want to use an arbitral institution, how do I go about it? So the last leg seeks to answer um, these questions. I believe that my brother and sister, my brothers and sister Nania have spoken to you at length about the benefits of ADR. And so by way of emphasis, I, I just want to explain why ADR is beneficial. You know, the story, is always, or the illustration is always um, told about how, even if you go to um, a hospital right now and you have various ailments, you have people with areas of, of specialty expertise in that particular area. For instance, if it is an ear infection, you would want to see the ENT specialist and not necessarily go to a general practitioner. If it is about your child, you'd want to see a pediatrician, for instance, and so on and so forth. If it is about cancer, you may want to see the urologist, etc. And so the same illustration is brought to bear in dispute or dispute resolution. The idea that a one cup fits all has clearly been criticized and thereby litigation, which has for some time now been the only, if not the, the, the mostly used means of dispute resolution has clearly been criticized because it is not all type of disputes that are 
best resolved through um, litigation, just like it is not all types of ailments that are best resolved by a general practitioner. Sometimes you need to have the expertise of certain groups of persons. Of course, I'm not oblivious to the fact that it is often said that the law is in the bottom of the chart, but clearly, even within the court, you have sometimes important um, um, witnesses, expert witness to speak to the matter. While in ADR, for instance, in arbitration, you may have a sole arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators who are well versed. And so it makes easy because there's no added um, obligation of the panel now going to learn about the subject area. So depending on your SME you are involved, you may have certain persons within that particular trade who understand and who appreciate um, the nitty gritties of, uh, of that particular trade and who will be best suited to resolve as neutrals to resolve those disputes. So the same has been um, explained about the benefits of ADR, that it gives parties and for you SME um, persons, the opportunity to appoint persons who are well versed in the particular trade that you're involved in, or who have some substantial knowledge to help resolve disputes. And of course, one of the other benefits I've talked about is um, party involvement or what we usually call party autonomy in ADR. You know, as you found, most of you who have been, uh, who have had to go through litigation before in the court, you will find out that when you file a matter at the registry of the courts, you do not determine, except that you determine the area. So if it's land, you file a land matter at the land courts, but that's about it. You do not determine, for instance, let me bring it to Ghana that, oh, it is a Justice Anochijima in land court two that I want to resolve this matter. It is the registry that determines um, the particular judge for you. But with ADR, there is a party involvement. There's a party autonomy for, for a large number of things who becomes your neutral, whether it is mediation or arbitration, who, I mean, how you want the process to be held, etc. The procedures are all determined by the party. So the benefits summed up as very suitable mechanisms because I've explained that you get a suitable or appropriate resolution of your dispute using the appropriate mechanism. So the ENT specialist scenario. This SME, I think, should go to this particular person because he's well first in the tree. Again, parties are more involved in the process and they determine who and when and how the whole process should be resolved. Of course, we've talked about cost and we realized that, I mean, and, and like uh, <clears throat> Nanya finished off saying that, um, I've had people tell me that, but arbitration is quite expensive. And I said, well, it depends on how you see cost or what you clarify, you classify as cost. You know, because of course, if you have, excuse me, um, about $1 million case and you're spending about $200,000 to resolve it within min maximum for, for a year, six months, as the case may be, <clears throat> somebody may see that as less expensive than having a case or a matter dragged through the courts for about 10 years. And perhaps every day that your lawyer goes to court, you're probably paying him TNT beside the filing fees and the uh, um, the legal fees that you pay to the court. And of course, I don't know how you quantify, for instance, the emotional stresses that comes with uh, um, going to court for that number of years, let's say 10, five, two, three, however you look at it. I don't also know how you quantify the time that you spend leaving your workplace or looking for witnesses, looking for other materials to help you um, litigate your matter in court. So when people say arbitration is expensive, I say, well, it depends on how you want to look at cost or what is cost to you. For somebody who, um, I mean, there's, a, there's a, a joke normally told of this woman who had had BP or high blood pressure for a number of years and uh, the, you went to see the doctor, so she was on medicine. And finally it was um, a litigation she was involved in and the matter was finally decided and, and, and she won. I mean, it was decided in her favor. And some days subsequent to that, <clears throat> her personal doctor found that her blood pressure had um, stabilized and was quite good. And, and it, it, I mean, eventually they discovered that at every time when she had to go to court, every month when the case is um, adjourned and she has to attend court, she realized that automatically her blood pressure will just rise. I don't know how you would quantify that as cost. I don't know how you'd quantify that. So relatively, I think the empirical research abounds that ADR is still relatively cheaper than litigation. Of course, added to it is the issue of time and speed um, for ADR.
And of course, because of some of the tenets of ADR, such as privacy, where only parties and at best their lawyers attend the ADR process. And also one of the tenets of ADR being confidentiality, that any admissions, any processes, documents that are used, but for the purpose of ADR would not have been available out there. These issues all remain confidential, especially for you SME. Some of you may have certain trade secrets. Some of you may have some ingredients by which you prepare your, your whatever food restaurant, I mean, whatever products that you have. And of course, once you're taken to court, you'll be required to be examined to speak to some of these trade secrets that ordinarily you wouldn't want the general public um, to be aware of out there. And so that is also one of the added benefits of ADR. And of course, there are lots, but I also end with the fact that ADR helps to maintain business relationships. And for you SMEs, you need that more than ever because it's a long-term hoping to rise beyond the, the SME level into a bourgeois and very big you know, enterprises. And so one of the things you want to have, whether it be your traders, whether it be your suppliers, whether it be your, your clients, whether it even be the community, even your landlord, however you look at it, you would not want to as a burden enterprise to serve those kind of relationships. And of course, ADR looks at a very mutual and beneficial, mutually beneficial way of resolving disputes as much as possible to maintain the relationship. And that for me is a highlight of the benefits of ADR in respect of the peculiar circumstance of SMEs. Now, having said, I believe that uh, Mania has spoken about what arbitration is, because the focus, my focus, of course, you'd have learned that there are various forms of ADR. Main, the three main processes of ADR being negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. Of course, due to the malleability of ADR, there can be what we call hybrids of ADR. We can even have other modes of ADR because the whole idea of ADR is that parties determine how their dispute will be resolved. Parties are part of it, of the whole dispute resolution. So there are other forms of ADR. You can talk about uh, med app, some even look at um, neut uh, early neutral evaluation, etc. But my focus today is on arbitration because I am speaking on um, arbitral institutions in Ghana. But of course, in, 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 in some few minutes, you realize that I, you would have learned that now that arbitration is, should be with the consent of both parties. And I, I think I, I heard once somebody ask a question that if it is by the consent of parties, why are persons compelled, particularly like under the um, Act 930 and other statutes to go to arbitration? And I heard um, Nanya respond to that. But a fundamentally is that when we say arbitration should be by the consent of both parties, we normally make a distinction between that and mediation, where with mediation parties can indeed be compelled to go for um, mediation, whether there is a mediation agreement or not, if you look at our, our uh, ADR Act. But with arbitration, there has to be the consent. And when there is a consent, parties are bound by the consent, the agreement, to go for arbitration. And so where you draft a dispute resolution clause in your, um, <clears throat> in your contract, and there's an arbitration that says that parties shall submit any dispute to arbitration, perhaps under a named arbitral institution. What it means then is that parties are bound where there is a dispute to submit that dispute to arbitration. Now, somebody may ask, so what happens if the other person does not attend arbitration? Like we see even in the courts that you see somebody and they will never appear before the court. By the laws of arbitration, a party, one party can decide it is in their best interest to attend arbitration because with or without that arbitration, as long as due processes and notices have been complied with, arbitration will still go on. Your, in att your um, not attending arbitration does not stop the arbitration where there's an arbitration clause agreement, does not stop the arbitration from, go from proceeding. Now arbitration, just like uh, <clears throat> litigation, there's a judicial hearing. I mean, some, I remember one of my students telling me after I've explained what arbitration is all about, I said, but then arbitration is just like litigation, except that you choose your judge and you choose where you want to have it and what route you want to have. And I said, yes. In fact, with arbitration, there's also a judicial hearing. When we say judicial hearing, um, it's uh, the, the arbitrator or the arbitral tribunal, the panel of arbitrators or the sole arbitrator 
whichever the case may be, actually listens to both parties uh, where evidences are adduced, there is cross-examination, just like we see in the court system, except like my student rightly noted, the judge now in the case of arbitration is the arbitrator you yourself as parties jointly have agreed on. And you can also decide the rules and procedures for resolving that dispute. Again, a characteristic of arbitration is that there is a delivery of an award. <clears throat> so just as a judge in a courtroom gives a judgment or delivers a judgment, the arbitral tribunal in the case of arbitration delivers what we call an award. And of course, for us in Ghana here, our um, ADR Act, that is Act 798, if you look at Section 52, we're told that a judge, an arbitral award is enforced in the same manner as the judgment of the court. And so if there's a, an arbitration clause in your agreement, you are assured that if the person attends it or not, arbitration will go on after they've been served with all the processes and materials and they still fail to attend arbitration. Arbitration will proceed, there will be an award and the award that will be given if it is in your favor, it is as if it is any court, a high court in Ghana, which has delivered that award and you can enforce it against the other party, just like you enforce or execute um, judgments of the, of the court. <clears throat> of course, you will know now that Ghana, in Ghana, arbitration and ADR is regulated by the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act of Ghana. And I will highly recommend, of course, now it's um, available even on the, on the internet, you can just Google it. I would advise you as SMEs to get a copy of this um, ADR Act. Now, once there is an arbitration clause or agreement in any contract you sign with anyone, um, what it means is that once there's a dispute, you must necessarily go to arbitration. Now, how do you start? Normally, some people would, would, would state in their clause that they would use particular rules or they will go for arbitration under a particular institution or what we call an arbitral institution. There are two types of um, arbitra um, <coughs> arbitration procedures. You can either have the arbitration under what we call ad hoc arbitration or what we call an institutional arbitration. Now with the ad hoc arbitration, it is normally parties themselves who decide based on the rules. Now, one of the catch of that is that you may have to spell out a lot of things. So ad hoc is like you yourselves meet wherever you so decide, you know. And so you decide to use, let's say, the rules of the Ghana ADR Hub or the Ghana Arbitration Center. It is up to you, but there's no fixed um, entity or institution that will help you to administer, to help you administratively. So every process of the ad hoc institution, it's a matter of decision and consent by the parties themselves. The reason why people usually recommend institutional arbitration rather than ad hoc arbitration is because of the benefits that comes with institutional arbitration. With institutional arbitration, you have an institution, an arbitral institution like the Ghana ADR Hub or the Ghana Arbitration Center, which will man or supervise. They don't dictate for you, but they normally serve as a backup. And so where there is a gap in some of the procedural rules, for instance, then the arbitral institution fills that gap. For instance, if you fail to, uh, to decide the number of arbitrators, for instance, in your arbitration agreement or clause, and there's a dispute because they are one party A say, no, I want three arbitrators, party B it's say, no, I want just a sole arbitrator, one arbitrator, and it is difficult to decide. Now the appointing authority being the arbitral institution, in that case, because you've adopted the arbitral institution to supervise the arbitration and you've adopted its rules to help you spearhead the arbitration process, you realize that the Ghana um, ADR Hub rule or the Ghana Arbitration Center rule, for instance, say that where parties are unable to agree, for instance, on the number of um, arbitrators, then the arbitrator shall be one. So then because you're unable to agree, then there's a fallback on that arbitral institutions which decides in what will be the number one in this case, if that is the rule. But of course, what with that ad hoc um, institution, unless you have used the particular rules like the on rules, which then tells you what will be 
the, the default or what would be the resolution where you don't agree on a particular procedure, then it becomes quite tough because when disputes arise, most of you know that it is almost impossible for the disputing parties to agree on anything at all. And so one of the advantages of um, institutional arbitration over ad hoc arbitration is that institutional arbitration will serve as a backup will administer the procedure, the arbitration procedure for the parties. And where there is a, a lack of consensus on a particular procedural matter, it is the arbitral institutions based on the adoption of its rules will determine the matter in this instance. Now, arbitral institutions tend to play a very crucial role in the in arbitration regime. And I'm going to tell you why arbitral institutions like where I, I am as the vice president, the Ghana ADR Hub and the Ghana Arbitration Center are relevant for SMEs while you plan your dispute resolution uh, uh, um, in future or presently. Now they're very relevant arbitral institutions under three main themes. The first is that most arbitral institutions help in the pre-dispute process. Now what I've classified as the pre-dispute process and what does that mean? Well, the pre-dispute process, most arbitral institutions, once you get to learn about them and know about them, even provide for you templates of um, arbitration clauses. I remember that Nanya says, uh, yes, of course, I would uh, advise you to always engage a lawyer as much as possible to help you in the drafting of the arbitration clauses. But most of these, almost all the institutions I know, arbitral institutions I know in the world will usually have as part as an annex or a schedule, dispute resolution um, clause templates, which you can adopt and put in your contract. So if you go to the Ghana ADR hub rules, for instance, if you look at our mediation rules and you look at our arbitration rules, we have examples of what a mediation um, agreement clause looks like. So for instance, you find at the back of our mediation rules that any dispute shall be resolved through mediation, etc. So you're able to, they help you plan the, the type of clause to insert in your contract. I'm also aware that most um, arbitration inst arbitral institutions like the Ghana ADR Hub also help to um, draft um, dispute designs, what we call dispute designs, like the Ghana ADR Hub. We, we as a part of our consultants, we listen to the needs of the particular business, including of course SMEs, and we are able to help you think through or design um, a dispute um, resolution clause as part of your agreement. Of course, I remember I heard Nani also talk about um, adopt also other methods. So some one of the things we tend to do more at the Ghana ADR is that we, we create a whole framework of dispute um, resolution design, which for instance, will say that when there's a dispute, you first attempt negotiation, mediation, etc. before arbitration. So the essence of arbitral institutions that most arbitral institutions that you join or you, 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 you join as a member or you follow through your engagement, help you to plan for your uh, um, disputes in, in the future. And of course, one of the essence of arbitral institute, which is the substantial thing to talk about in respect of uh, arbitral institutions is that when the disputes in fact arise, they become very essential because they help to administer the rules for you. Because if it is ad hoc where the parties themselves will have to go back and forth and decide every single procedural matter, it almost becomes something there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a deadlock between the parties. Now, when disputes actually arise, and for instance, you would have already inserted in your a contract that you resolve the disputes through arbitration under the arbitral arbitration rules of the Ghana ADR Hub, for instance. So what it means is that when there's a dispute, you go to the Ghana Arbitration, um, Ghana ADR Hub or the Ghana Arbitration Center, whichever you choose to help you administer as, um, uh, the, to help you administer the arbitration. I'm going to, the last bit, I'm going to talk about the actual process of going to the arbitral institutions. So I'll stick to the essence of these arbitral institutions for now. So most arbitral institutions are very helpful in this matter, in helping to administer arbitration proceedings. Thirdly, arbitral institutions are also essential. And most of these arbitral institutes have also tend to be 
a source of training uh, a, a resource. You know, most arbitral institutions beyond just helping you to plan your disputes in future, or just helping you to go through the disputes properly and resolve it through arbitration. They also tend to give enormous training to their participants or to their members as the case may be. So once you're a member, you usually get updates on the new trends and best practices of arbitration, for instance. Some have newsletters. Of course, some have, I mean, these kind of webinars and other trainings to help you appreciate and understand arbitral institutions and also um, new areas that may come up in, in arbitral um, institutions. One of the things I would want to add to this the essence of a arbitral institution is also the networking opportunity that being a member of these arbitral institutions present to you. Of course, it is through these um, arbitral institutions attending some of these trainings and webinars, etc., that I've been privileged to know people like Abayomi, Nania, of course, Nania in Ghana, Kenneth, and other people. Sometimes the training takers bring us together as practitioners of arbitration or advocates of arbitration where we share idea, we, 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 we explore new areas of disputes and come up with a clear understanding. I mean, if, if, even if it is to disagree, but to come on, on a clear understanding, substantial understanding of what is the best practices going on, all at the back of our mind that dispute resolution must always involve parties, must always be customized to meet the special needs of the dispute and the special needs of the parties, in your case, the SMEs. So again, the essence of arbitral institutions is to help build this network, exchange ideas, and you know, adopt and exchange best practices in making arbitration or ADR in general, the appropriate method of dispute resolution. And so you, I, know, I don't know if you have heard it before, some people have argued that the term ADR really is no alternative Another name for ADR is just not alternative dispute resolution, but in some cases, appropriate dispute resolution because you choose a dispute design which is appropriate to meet the needs of the particular business or the party. Some have also even opined that the abbreviation ADR in fact means what African dispute resolution, saying, arguing further that the whole idea of resolving disputes other than through the court is in fact orig or in fact originated from Africa, where we were resolving disputes using known, highly influential, reputable people of integrity and who were neutral and unbiased. We that was what we knew before, whether it be in our community, some respected person, or whether it be if it's a trade, we using merchants who were well versed in the particular trade. And so Arguably, some people have also opined that ADR is in fact African dispute resolution. So these are the essence of arbitration institutions helping you to come up with resolution templates for the future, or sometimes even helping you to avoid the future. I mean, the, the disputes by if there is a dispute, they help to administer the dispute for you to guard the process of dispute resolution. There's also practical knowledge for the future an appreciation of why ADR is an appropriate means of dispute resolution. And finally, you can't but recognize one of the essence of arbitral institutions being that as members of that arbitral institution, you strike a healthy network and help you to engage and also, also self-develop yourself and your business. So let me, I think I've already mentioned through my earlier, um, explanation, the examples of arbitral institutions in Ghana. So really what are arbitral institutions? As I've mentioned, these are institutions that are set up to help people like you who have arbitration clauses in your agreement and where there is such an, a, a dispute and you want to go to arbitration, they welcome you, they help you. Set, so it's like they, they become like the registry of the courts, as we know it. So they help when you file something, you file it with the arbitral institutions. They exchange your whatever processes you, you've respectively filed. They serve it on the other parts. They call you up. You have a, a, a hearing this day, etc. So I'll speak more about this uh, at the last part. And so I've distinguished again between ad hoc and institutional arbitration. 
Well, there's the opposite of institutional arbitration is hard. You don't have any institution really set down as the institution to administer the arbitration for you. Now, there are two examples of arbitral institutions in Ghana, and I encourage you to look more uh, into these two, follow them, join them as members. Of course, if they are beyond Ghana, they are a plethora of um, arbitral institutions through, and various institutions offer this similar um, assistance and networking for arbitration. We have the LCIA, the CIR, um, a lot of these people. Of course, I'll take the opportunity to also encourage you to be following uh, Abayomi's uh, African Arbitration Academy. And I have benefited a lot based on the programs that they have run and the, the, the newsletters that they have issued, etc. So in Ghana and for the purposes of SMEs in Ghana, the two arbitral institutions in Ghana are the Ghana ADR Hub <clears throat> the Ghana Arbitration Center. You can Google both of them. You visit their website and learn more about them. They have um, rules where, which you can adopt as the rules to be used for resolving your dispute. Now, one of the good things about the two have, and of course, with the help of COVID has taught us that even though both of them may be physically located in a particular area, their hearings move beyond their physical location. And so I've been privileged now, I'm currently wrapping up on one arbitration that I'm doing with the Ghana Arbitration Center. And I don't have to because of COVID, we do it online. Again, I remember by when um, this whole issue of COVID came down, a lot of these arbitral institutions came up with webinars on the role of virtual hearings in um, of arbitration. So again, like I talked about, once you're a member of these institutions, you get to um, read into and join discussions on new areas of arbitration. So virtual hearings of <clears throat> in arbitration has become a very topical issues now uh, in arbitration and came up primarily when COVID uh, disabled all of us from having any meaningful physical hearings and interaction. And so look more into these two, the Ghana ADR Hub, the Ghana Arbitration Center, find their rules. Of course, <clears throat> you may have heard that if you're drafting um, an arbitration clause or agreement in your contract and you are choosing a particular um, arbitral, the rules, arbitration rules of a particular arbitral institution, it is a sin not to be conversant with the rules of that particular arbitral institution. Because like I talked to you about, if for instance, an arbitral institution says, well, if you cannot agree on who should be appointed arbitrator for us, this is the mode of selection of arbitrator. So if you just blindly, uh, let's say, adopt a particular arbitral institution to help you administer your arbitration proceeding without knowing the basics of that, the, of that, uh, of those arbitration rules, you may probably be choosing something you did not sign up for. And so my advice generally with arbitral institution is that you wouldn't want to know some basics of what the rules of that particular arbitration institutions indicate so that whenever you adopt the rules to help you procedurally in running the administration, you will be, know exactly what you are signing up for. So the Ghana ADR and Ghana Arbitration Center now, both of them afford the opportunity to join as a member without necessarily being there physically. And of course, hearings too due to COVID has taught us that even arbitration um, hearings can also be done virtually. So the two examples are the Ghana ADR and the Ghana Arbitration Center. Now, what are some of the advantages of institutional arbitration? The advantages based on what I may have told you so far is that there is certainty and predictability of the dispute resolution process. Now, what do I mean by that? Because you will know the rules of that arbitration center, uh, institution, you would know that for the Ghana ADR Hub, for instance, hearing can be done um, virtually online. You know that if uh, the language, we don't even agree on language, there's English that is going to be used. This is the mode of selection of, uh, of arbitrators. There's the listing basis, or um, this is how they allow parties to choose arbitration. Please excuse me just a minute. All right, thank you everyone. While waiting for Diana, um, there's a survey at the end of the training. Uh, right. love... okay, Diana, are you back? Yes. Please. Thank you. Please so there's a sense of predictability of the procedure 
that will be adopted. Then I've mentioned that they cover certain gaps where there's a reversionary power to the institution. Generally, parties determine language, the rules to be used, um, the procedure to be adopted. But where parties omit, whether through inadvertence or um, intentionally, that power, that gap that may be created because parties did not agree on every single procedural matter will revert to the arbitral institution who will now fill in the gap where there is such gap. Of course, back to the certainty and predictability, for instance, you want to know how a particular arbitral institution, they deal with, for instance, expert witness, how they deal with um, how awards, the mode of um, rendering awards, et cetera. So once you know that if I have a dispute and if I go to the Ghana ADR Hub or I go to the Ghana Arbitration Center, this is how the process will run. And that gives you some sense of certainty or predictability of how the dispute resolution will be um, resolved. Of course, let me also mention briefly that most of these arbitral institutions will have a list of arbitrators. Now they will have experts and not necessarily lawyers as I had one of the question points out, not necessarily lawyers as arbitrators. So they will have, if you go to their website or if you inquire from these arbitral institutions, they have a list of arbitrators with their profile so for instance, you, if it's a survey dispute, uh, if, if it's a building dispute, if it's a trading cloth, if it, for you SMEs, if it is a production, it is a manufacturing business, you would have, for instance, as part of the listed profiles of these arbitrators saying that, oh, um, Abayomi is one of the listed arbitrators of Ghana um, ADR Hub. He has expertise in this area, he has expertise in finance, he has ex expertise in entrepreneurship, he has expertise in, in fact, et cetera. And so when you see the profile of those persons and it comes to selection of an arbitrator, of course, you, you, you are in a comfortable zone because you know that there is an expert as a listed arbitrator under that arbitral institution who would understand what business the, your business means, who understand them, um, for instance, that what time means for you in business, who understand or appreciate what business relationship means for you in the business and will then conduct the arbitration proceeding accordingly. So that would uh, explain the point about arbitral institutions. Advantage of it is that it affords the relevant expertise in dispute uh, resolution. And of course, the administrative support. Because when you have a dispute with somebody, you want to, for instance, file your reliefs, what you are claiming, <clears throat> so that the other parts will know that, look, this is what you've done that I see as a breach of our contract. And that is why I want us to settle this matter. Sometimes even letting them how to serve or forward all those documents to the other party becomes problematic without the assistance of an arbitral institution. So the arbitral institution in this regard serves as the receiving institution. So whatever process you want to file, if it's a claim, if it's a demand, if it's an application for injunction, for instance, you file it at the arbitration uh, uh, arbitral institution and they will intend uh, because they will require certain copies most of them they require substantial so sufficient copies to enable them to keep one on their records to give one to serve the other parties and then also serve um, give copies to the arbitral tribunal so just like we see in the registrar that if you want to file a writ of summons if you want to file your statement of defense if you want to apply for injunction if you want any relief etc the way you will file at the registry of the court. So the arbitral institution serves as that registry. When the disputes, the arbitration proceedings start, you file all your processes with the administration or the secretariat of that arbitral institution. Then they will intend serve as the bailiffs and the, as we know them in court and clerks, and they will intend serve the other party. The other party also responds. They will also serve you same. Uh, the arbitral uh, tribunal, whether it's a panel of arbitrators or a sole arbitrator, wants to uh, notify you to uh, take particular action or what we call procedural orders. He sends it to the arbitral institution. The arbitral institution will also serve both parties with the procedural order and say that, look, the arbitral tribunal said you should all file your witness statement within this particular date. You should bring your witnesses on this particular day, etc. So the arbitral institution gives that administrative support to both parties. I've also mentioned to you that um, one of the advantages of uh, institutional arbitration is the template 
dispute resolution clauses that they provide. And of course the training in arbitration and other ADR methods that you will not have. Uh, you, I mean, you may have, but it's more run and administered by these um, arbitral institutions. I want you to note as um, the set point, one of the advantages of ADR is the invaluable networking opportunities that being a member of these arbitral institutions afford to its members. Right, so I will now, I mean, I mean, the last slide, I mean, the last session, I will seek to talk about the advantage, um, the basic mo modalities. And for this, I want to uh, focus more on the Ghana ADR Hub, where I'm a vice president, but also hastily add that the rules are not different substantially from even the Ghana Arbitration Center or almost all the arbitral institutions that I know. So for instance, there are two ways by which the Ghana ADR have usually received uh, or starts arbitration pro um, proceedings. At the Ghana ADR have, we sit there and I mean, I mean we, and we and wait for disputes to come. So don't, don't start looking at me like we are like the coffin maker who is sitting there and, and hoping somebody dies. Not really, but we, in a very positive way, we, we hope we, we're there waiting for parties who have in advance or at the point of dispute decided to resolve it through arbitration. We are there. Now we receive arbitration proceedings in two forms. So there are some times where we have um, an order by the court. So usually there will be an arbitration clause or an agreement in your contract. For instance, party A and party B, and they decided to supply, let's say, um, um, raw materials for let's say the production of um, some food products, shit or, or to clothing, etc., And there's a breach of that agreement, but as part of the contract to supply those raw materials, it's a dispute clause that says that where there is a dispute between us, we will resolve it through negotiation. If negotiation fails after 30 days, there's no result. We'll go through mediation. If mediation doesn't resolve it, then we'll go to arbitration. And of course, you would hear from Nanya that um, arbitration is final and it's binding. So never put in your clause that if arbitration fails, then we'll go to the court because arbitration will never fail. There will definitely be a hearing. There will definitely be a delivery award, whether a party attends or not. So after arbitration and the award is given, it is final. It's not as if, if arbitration fails, then we also go to the court. So then party A, they might have attended this um, webinar and found out that yeah, it's best that you use uh, an arbitral institution to conduct or administer the arbitration proceedings. So they probably had um, in their contract that if there's a DP, we resolve it through the arbitration rules under the Ghana ADR hub. So party A is not happy that party B has violated a provision of the contract to supply at a particular date. So sometimes this is how we get um, the proceedings at the Ghana ADR. Either through inadvertence or uh, willfully, party A will sue party B in court that we had a contract, there was a, an agreement to supply on a particular date and time, but he has failed to do so. And I have incurred some loss based on that. So party A goes to court. So party B then responds to court by our ADR Act of Ghana Act 798, when there is such a dispute, the defendant, in this case, Party B, once he enters appearance to the writ of summons that had been um, initiated at the court, he would then ask the court to stay the proceeding and say, uh, my Lord, um, I don't think this matter should be decided in the court here because Party A and B, Party A and I, we entered into a dispute resolution clause that says that we're going to go to arbitration at the Ghana ADR hub. So by law again, which is the Act 798, then the judge is mandated to do what we call stay proceedings. So the judge says, that's true. Let me see your arbitration agreement. Oh, your contract, right, is there. Clause 10 clearly is there. It says that you must, you shall go to Ghana ADR. So I'm gonna stay proceedings, right? I'm not gonna go on. Both of you, I'm ordering you to go to the Ghana ADR hub. 
for arbitration. So normally you realize that we have this order and then the claimants will come to the Ghana ADR hub and file what we call a request for arbitration and attach all the orders, including his um, the disputes, the claims, what he's asking for. Sometimes they will say that, okay, I'm adopting my statement of claim, which I filed at the court, which I forgot and I filed at the court because it wasn't supposed to be in court in the first place. I'm adopting it as my claim in this arbitration. So we've had that instances before. But the best mode, which I would advise you, because now going to the court before there's a stay and coming back will all be eating into time and money. So once you know that there's an arbitration clause in your contract, you must go to arbitration. Then you don't go all round, round, round before. So the second mode by which you've been receiving um, um, requests is that, again, party A and party B have a dispute clause that says they go to arbitration using the arbit arbitration rules of the Ghana ADR hub. So Patia is very knowledgeable in arbitration and says, oh, so this breach of contract, I've asked him to pay me damages and he's not paying. So this is a dispute. So I'm going to go to the ADR hub because that is what we have in our contract. So if that is the situation, which is mostly the situation, because once you know there's an arbitration clause in your contract, you don't waste your time going to court to even get a stay of proceedings before you come back. It's all time and money. So such a knowledgeable person will say, well, I remember we said Ghana ADR. So what do you do? You, if you look at our arbitration rules, which is online, which is on our website, it says that if you think there's a dispute and the dispute you agree to go on arbitration and you've specifically chosen the Ghana ADR, for instance, this is what you do. I'm also gonna later explain to you what you do if you haven't chosen the Ghana ADR, but you still want to come to the Ghana ADR. So let's start with the first one, where you've chosen the Ghana ADR. So you go strictly according to what your contract says. You come to us. Now, most of these institutions have administrators. Now, you don't even have to be physically that you can contact them through email or phone. You do what we call a request for arbitration. So you can title it just like uh, you have it, part A versus part B. And then you, you the heading will be request for arbitration. If you look at our rules, it says that you write to the administrator of the Ghana ADR rules and say that, look, I have this dispute, basically give us a brief fact of the dispute and then spell out what you are claiming. That I have this, um, there's a contract dated 9th March, 2020 between my company or my business or between myself individual as a person and the other party, which agreement was that he would supply me with these raw materials, uh, let's say uh, herrings, uh, fish, whatever, to enable me to prepare my shuttle as a business I operate. Now he had failed to, even though I've paid these sums, he has to date failed to um, finish or supply these raw materials and because of the incredibility. And therefore I'm claiming this amount for breach of contract. I'm also claiming interest on the amount. I'm also claiming um, this damages, general damages from the other party. So you you write to us as the Ghana ADR and, 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 and request for arbitration. And then in the request for arbitration, you let us know who the other party is. So you give us your address, first of all, as party A. You tell us that my address of claimants, the one who first goes to the ADR hub to claim something against the other party is called the claimant. So you give the address of the claimant and see address for claimants is let's say Latabi Okoshi, uh, plot one, um, house number 332, Latabi Okoshi, Accra. Um, telephone number is this, so in case we want to reach out to you. And that's why you give us all the contact details that we need is essential for you, the claimant. You also give us the contact details of the other party whom you are bringing to arbitration or what's in litigation, you say the one you are suing. You give us the contact details of that um, other party and give us a brief fact of the dispute, what it is about. And you give us what you want us. I mean, what you want the arbitration tribute, the arbitral tribunal you'll be choosing what you want from them, what you are requesting from them. Now you follow all these documents with uh, the Ghana ADR Hub. Once we, see, we receive your documents, the request for arbitration, the contact details, the brief facts, the claim, the release, et cetera, we would then write to the other party that we have received this claim and serve all your documents um, that you have served us. We will serve it on the other party. Now, when the other party receives it, they are also required then to file their response to the claim. So they also file a response. So just like you sue somebody at the court, you issue a writ of summons 
So in the case of the claimant, the rate of summons will be the, the request for arbitration. And in the case of the party B who is responding to the claim as a respondent will be like your statement of defense if you were in court. So he will now, the other party will now respond to the Ghana arbitration, also file um, what we call their response to the claim and say that I reject, I, I do not, I disagree or um, just like you say, I deny clause one, I deny clause two. Yes, I deny clause two partially, but I also say that there's no, when we, we agree that they would be the one to receive payment, but the first day that we went to supply, there was nobody on the premises. And so we had to go back. And since then the goods have uh, rotten and it is not our fault because they were also not at the place of delivery to take, to take um, delivery. So you also respond and if you also have a, a counterclaim as the respondent, you also include a counterclaim that says that, well, even we also want to counterclaim against them because we spend this amount of money to drive all the way to Latabi Okoshi from Bogatanga to deliver the goods. They were not there to take up delivery. We had to um, come back, transport the monies we spent, etc. We've also lost the goods because we could not resell it because they got rotten, etc. So if you also have a counterclaim, as the respondent, you also found your counterclaim and you also, you deny or admit what the claimant has first said. And if you have a counterclaim, you also add, and you also let us know what um, you're also claiming from the other part, assuming you have a counterclaim. And then after this, then the, usually you have to pay the administrative fee because of course the ritual institution receiving all your documents and passing it over to one another and serving over only involves some cost. So usually, again, it's also crucial if you are choosing a particular arbitral institution to know what the administrative costs are. Most of these arbitral institutions charge administrative costs based on the amount involved in the arbitration. So you want to know, for instance, if it's some no charge between let's say 5% to 10% of the amount, but if it is beyond, let's say 1 million, it is capped at a particular figure. Of course, in doing your economics and calculations on your dispute um, processes, you'd want to be um, conversant with some of these um, charges or administrative um, fees. Of course, I know some institutions also, um, the arbitrator, listed arbitrators also have their charges. Some charge hourly, some charge based on the expertise, et cetera. So again, it's something you want to look more into it in determining who you choose as an arbitrator, for instance. So after you've done all the services of what we call your pleadings, your claim and your response, and then there's a reply. So party A says, no, it's not true that when you came, I wasn't there. In fact, we were there, the agreement was 9 a.m., but you came 12 hours later. So if there's a reply to the response by the party B, you also file the response. And then usually the, you proceed with the help of the admin arbitral institutions to appoint, to constitute the arbitral tribunal. So if it is easier for parties to agree that, okay, we are, we're gonna go ahead with arbitration and we are gonna, we know that we see that uh, Mr. Bayomi is one of the listed arbitrators of Ghana ADR. Arab. So both of you agree that we want uh, Abayomi as the arbitrator. It makes life very easy for all of you, but sometimes you may not. And usually, again, once you don't agree, the arbitral institutions falling. For instance, you find that with the Ghana ADR, which I'm speaking to, where there is a, at the point where you need to constitute the arbitral tribunal, the, the judges, the arbitrators to sit on the matter, and you do not agree, we use what we call the listing system. It's part of our rules. That if both of you cannot agree to decide on a biomy, for instance, we will help you to agree because definitely we have to constitute the, the tribunal one way or the other. So for the Ghana ADR, we use what we call the listing system. So the administrator of the Ghana ADR will write to both of you and say that, okay, so you need arbitrators, right? You haven't been able to decide. Both of you haven't been able, you have chosen a biome, party has chosen a biome, party B has chosen Kenneth. You seem not to agree. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to send you a list of our arbitrators, both of you, the same list. And you are to tell us in order of priority whom you like. So tell us, they say, number one, we'll choose Abayomi, number two, we'll choose Kenny, number three, we'll choose Nane, number four, we'll choose um, Diana, for instance. Party B, you also do the same thing. Now, when you receive your choice of the list given to you, the common denominator, the highest common denominator 
among what you have chosen. So if you realize that um, party A would have chosen Abayome as uh, first, but Kenneth as second, and um, uh, Nania as third, and party B will, uh, would have also chosen Nania as first, Kenneth as second, Diana as third. So you realize that the common highest denominator among the two will be what? Kenneth. So by the rules of application, once we use the common denominator, highest common denominator, then Kenneth, by the rules that you have chosen, that you use the arbitrary arbitration rules of the Ghana ADR, what it means is that Kenneth would then be chosen for you by the arbitral institution as the arbitrator. And thereafter, the arbitral, the, what, the arbitral tribunal is deemed to be constituted. So when we say arbitral tribunal, it's either the sole arbitrator or the panel of arbitrators, usually three, five, or the odd number that parties may decide. So then usually, after the request for arbitration, the response, the payment of the relevant administrative fees, the constitution of the arbitral tribunal. So if it is a sole arbitrator like Kenneth, then Kenneth meets the parties, usually through what we call pre-hearings. And then he sits down with you and says, okay, I've received your claim. I've also looked at your response. Now let's agree. I want both of you to file in arbitration. We use what we call witness statements. I think most of you are in court in Ghana now, uh, where they're now in, um, in our trials, we use um, witness statement. So you file your witness statement, which is the evidence. So witness statement, for those of you who are not concerned with witness statement, unlike previously, where if you want to litigate a matter, you stand in the box, what we call the witness box, and then you give your oral evidence so that the judge now notes everything that we have now reduced all of that into writing. So whatever you would have said, whatever evidence you would have given while standing in the witness box, uh, you all put all of it in writing as witness statements. And you attach all the evidences, let's say, if it is the contract you attach as exhibit, if it is an email you, he sent you admitting that, oh, I'm sorry, we indeed, we came 12 hours late, we are sorry, we'll pay up. You add all your exhibit evidences as exhibit to the witness statement. So it's at the, these hearings that the arbitrator, Kenneth, in this regard, will say, okay, so file your witness statement at this time. I want to know the number of witnesses you are bringing, and we're going to have our hearings on this particular day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, at 3 p.m., at 6 a.m., at 8 p.m. Of course, the arbitral tribunal usually does that with the consent and assistance of the parties. Where he normally, they would throw it to the parties to decide, for instance, the day of hearing, the time of hearing, etc. If they're unable to agree, usually the rules of the arbitral institution will determine and will give the discretion to the arbitral tribunal to determine based on tenets such as what, um, uh, such as uh, equity, tenets such as speed, tenets such as reasonableness. So to decide on issues that have not been decided, which is reasonable and equitable in the circumstances and enables the matter to expeditiously be dealt with, et cetera. So then the, when all these have been decided, the arbitrator says, file your witness statement. When you filed everything, usually there's a final pre-hearing Review, um, review where you determine you, you take all the checklist have you filed your witness statement yes check have you um also attached is there are you bringing any expert witness yes we are bringing a, a surveyor or we are bringing a, a biochemist to come and explain that it is the 12 hours delay that caused the the hearings to the uh, to rot etc so yeah you will bring expert witness okay check uh, yes um how many days would you need for the hearing two hours for two days, two days, okay, good. You, how many days, okay, good. Okay, then we are going to agree next week, Monday and Tuesday, we'll give four hours to each of you to, to cross-examine the other party. Because you would have filed witness statements, you don't now bring your parties to give evidence. You only bring them so that they can be cross-examined on the witness statements that they have filed as their evidence to be used in the arbitration. So that's why we say arbitration involves a judicial hearing. So the arbitral tribunal will now listen to the cross-examination, will now read through and review the witness statement that has been that have been filed as the evidences of the respective parties. So then there's the day of the hearing itself. Of course, you could decide a whole lot of things. For instance, uh, we're going to use the English language, we're going to use tree, we're going to need interpreter, etc. All of those are decided before the, the date of um, hearing itself. 
But again, let me add that in as much as the arbitrator is um, going to determine the matter, he does not do so outside the scope of the contract or the arbitration agreement or clause, or neither does he do that outside the scope of law. So for instance, if parties have decided, for instance, that they're going to use the, the rules of, uh, let's say, uh, or the own structural rules or the rules of procedure of, let's say, a named or the substantive law, the law that's governing the uh, arbitration proceeding should be, let's say, French law. The arbitrator cannot on his own says, no, I'm going to use uh, English law because um, that's what I think would help. So unless where parties have expressly determined, for instance, the governing law, etc., the arbitral tribunal must stick with that. It is where there is no clear determination of, for instance, the governing law that the arbitrator may then decide to use, what does the arbitral rule say of the Ghana ADR, but where there is no clear mention of what the governing law is, which law am I going to use? In our case, is what the laws of Ghana. So then I'm going to use the laws of Ghana. So the arbitrator then hears all these matters, listen to it like a judge would do in a judicial manner, course examination, notes all the laws that are applicable and then delivers what we call an award. Now it is that award which is seen as a judgment of the court. So Kenneth Ohimenu listens to both parties, reviews the evidences they have presented through their witness statement through the, uh, um, the cross-examination, the evidence that came out. And then he was given a time, some time, usually not long. And of course, the whole idea behind ADR is speed. So the arbitral tribunal safeguards the procedure. So usually where there is a, a delay by one of the parties, usually cost may be awarded or sometimes they, they will be given some warnings that if at the next agenda, you are not able to produce this, the arbitral these proceedings is gonna go on, for instance. So the whole proceedings is conducted with expeditious trial in mind, that it will be done expeditiously, of course, without slaughtering um, the rule of law and the laws that have been decided by the parties without slaughtering those two. So after, ev after everything, the hearing, um, usually the parties will, just like courts, will deliver their closing addresses to the parties where they sum up uh, everything that they have brought to the table, to the arbitration table, that this is our case, this is our evidence. We've also uh, reviewed the evidence of the other. They have still failed to disprove our claim, etc. And so we believe that uh, we should be, um, the award should be given in our favor. Then finally, the arbitrator, the arbitral tribunal will deliver the award, which uh, mostly, most arbitral tribunals um, require that the award be reasoned, as in the award shouldn't say, I find in favor of party or party, but should explain why the arbitrator <coughs> finds uh, in, in favor of party or be. Let me go some few steps back. So in the course of the hearing, you, you can also, if you want to bring a witness to testify on your behalf, the witness that you want to bring, for instance, your, your caretaker, or your general manager who was there at the morning to receive delivery, but waited for 12 hours and then nothing happened together with, let's say one of your office clerks were there, then they want to testify to add up to your case. They also would file and what we call a witness statement. In addition to you as a, let's say the sole proprietor or the manager, they will also file witness statement. If there's any um, expert witness, like I mentioned, that you want to bring to the arbitration, to testify on your behalf to so that your claim will be upheld over the claim, the counterclaim of the other party. You also bring such an expert witness who also file a witness statement. So mostly for arbitration to the point that you would um, have oral hearing is where there's cross-examination. Most of these things are, are written for the and served on the other party so that they can have an answer if they so wish for whatever you file. So after the award, two things can happen. I haven't forgotten, I'll come back to when none of you have chosen any of the arbitrary institution, what happens? And usually that's very risky, but I'll tell you what happens. So usually when there's an award, two things can happen. Either that uh, the parties appreciate, understand, and are amenable to complying with the award. So let's say the, the arbitral tribunal finds for party and says that, Party B has breached the contract and therefore we award, let's say, um, 
100,000 CDs damages in favor of party A. Two things can happen. Party B can say, okay, it's okay. No worries, I admit, we admit fault. So we're gonna pay the 100,000 and they pay the 100,000 to party A. But usually sometimes to party B we say, well, I do not agree or whether through whatever strategy they may not pay after of course consistent uh, edging upon them to pay the 100,000. Now, what do you do? You now have an award in your hands stamp neatly signed by Kenneth with his beautiful signature, stamp by him and the uh, Ghana Diara. What do you do? That's the next question people like to ask. What you do is that you enforce it in court. Now, our act says that the arbitral award can be enforced in the same manner as a judgment of the court. So for those of you that are not conversant with litigation, whenever you go, you take a matter to court and there's litigation and there's a, uh, you know, people are fighting and you finally win the day they give judgment and you finally win and they carry you and put that power down you. That's not the end of the matter. The real matter comes because you have to now go and force the judgment against the other party. So for us, what the law, the Act 798 has done for us and arbitration is that once you get the award, it's like the day they have thrown that part on you at the court. But then you can, you know, when you win a judgment in court, you still have to do what we call a uh, file entry of judgment. Then the court will either you go for, go and garnish the account of the party who is not willing to pay or there's a five fee or whatever. So once you go to that, you get the award, you go to the court. The law says that you file what and it's an application you file with the court application for enforcement of arbitral award um pursuant to section 52 57 of act 79 saying go and tell my lord that my lord on this day we had this arbitration and this is the award i've received but the party b is failing to pay the hundred thousand the court is oh i see by act 798 because the award you gave even though it was given by kenneth or him, who is a, a, a law lecturer and not a judge i am to see that award that kenneth has given as, an, as a judgment. So I hereby adopt that award that um, Kenneth has given, and I'm going to help you to enforce it. So the court machinery or all the enforcement pro uh, procedures that we have in the court can be triggered. You can go and garnish the account. So the court will order the bank, let's say ADB is the account, it's where Part B keeps its account or the business account. You order Part B, uh, ADB to come to court and come and tell us how much Part B has in their accounts in their name and then order that that amount be used to pay you. If they don't have account in the money, you can go for any property that belongs to them. Use all the known procedures of enforcement. And so you would have bypassed all the 10 years of litigation up to the point of what delivery of judgment, because now you have an award in your hand, an arbitral award in your hand. And so by law and by Act 798, the court is mandated after you have gone through this process called arbitration and the, the other party fails to honor the terms of the award, to comply with the terms of the award. The court mandates the high court, and it is the high court that you go to, to adopt upon application, to adopt the award and enforce it in your favor against the other party party, be using all the known processes of execution, which we have, which I've talked about either going to the account who, or anybody who holds money on their behalf to take that money from that person and pay you or sell auction any of their properties to pay you etc so that is why arbitration is really now one of the advised and recommended method of this why while it is fast while it uses expertise and people who are well versed in your area to resolve the dispute the, the cherry on the top is that it is like a judgment of the court when you finally come to award and Nanya told you, you can't even appeal. You can only set it aside under very limited circumstances. For instance, you found out that the arbitral tribunal was bribed, there was fraud, corruption somewhere. He, the arbitral tribunal did not use the known laws or procedures that you agreed to. That's why I said that even though the arbitral tribunal decides the matter, he does not decide the matter outside the scope of what parties have decided. So if we decided that French law or apply will be the governing law. And he went to use English law. He has clearly acted outside the scope of what we decided. And so it is a basis for coming to court to say, no, I don't agree with the award and she set aside the award. So what, that's one of the beauty of arbitration. Now, let me finish off by saying that what happens if you have usually you would have a pathological arbitration clause and you do not, you just say, oh, any dispute will be resolved through arbitration, full stop. Clearly, the intention of party A and party B 
is to resolve their dispute through arbitration, but the question is where and how. And normally you don't state whether Ghana is here or Ghana Arbitration Center. So what happens? And again, I would say that that is, I will not recommend such a dispute um, arbitration clause in your contract because it lends itself to a lot of issues. And if you are not careful in part A and B are not wise in their own ways to agree on the procedural matters, you have back and forth, back and forth. And it, it will, you know, you will frustrate or you end up going to court for the court to order you to choose in order of preference which arbitral institutions or which rules you want to use. So again, we also have institutions where parties did not expressly provide that they will go for arbitration under the arbitration rules of the Ghana ADR. We've had such a situation. One, how do you resolve that? The best is for both of you to agree that you are in a quick meal of a sort. So the better, the earlier you agree that you will now go to the Ghana ADR hub or the Ghana Arbitration Center, the better. So sometimes, again, they will end up in courts because they are not agreeing that uh, they'll go here or there. Now, the Ghana ADRs Act provides for an ADR center, which ordinarily would have catered for some of these issues where there's not agreement. But as it stands now, the ADR center has not yet been established and it's not also in force. So normally what the courts will say is that, well, for, for all intentions, you want to go to arbitration, but you seem not to agree. So you're going to list uh, in three, perhaps in, again, the listing method. Your preference for which arbitration institution, or if you're going to use an ad hoc in, um, in, uh, arbitration, where you yourself will do the arbitration and nominate your own arbitrator with the help of the court in order of preference, which rules you're going to use. But we've had in situations where upon consultation with the parties, the courts have sought and have procured the consent of both parties that they will go to arbitration at Ghana Education Center and then they are ordered to come to us at the Ghana ADR Hub. Now the point is, and I would perhaps add that for SMEs, it is imperative that you understand that once you have agreed to arbitration, and even though it is a pathological clause, unless both of you agree again to discard arbitration, you are to go to arbitration. Because once you've agreed to it, the court will enforce that and ensure that you go on. So one part cannot say, well, now I'm no more interested in arbitration. And the other says, but I want to go to arbitration. The one who is saying I'm, I'm not interested and does not have a choice. Once he has chosen arbitration, it is arbitration it shall be. So when there are some of these pathological clauses, for instance, you don't know because you didn't choose which arbitral institutions or which rules you're going to use. It is imperative and good for both of you at that point to come to some form of consensus that, well, we are going to then go to Ghana ADR Hub or the Ghana Arbitration Center. So in other words, I will end by saying that I'm here to highly, highly recommend um, arbitral institutions for you, not because you just have um, disputes now. You don't have to wait for you to have disputes now. You can follow, you can join these arbitral institutions as a member. And as I've outlined the essence of these arbitral institutions, institutions even before you get to the point where you have a dispute you are bound to enjoy the fruits of membership of that arbitral institutions i'll end here i think we have just about five fifteen minutes and i'll use that opportunity to answer any questions that may not your mind on that note let me first of all appreciate um abayomi and his african arbitration academy and of course all the sponsors that have helped the academy to make this um, webinar a success and let me also thank you participants substantially because my my whole career has been talking but if there are no participants or students to listen then my talking shall be in vain and so let me thank all of you for indulging me all these almost one and a half hours i'll, I'll stand by for questions thank you very much thank you uh professor our deputy honorable deputy Attorney general the signet uh, for that excellent uh, presentation, of course, as usual. Uh, I think we have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Um, I don't know if you want to quickly ans answer them. Right. So, so I can read them out. Uh, please do. Or yeah. uh, you can take them. So, okay, okay. So the first one is by Robert. It says, who pays for the arbitration services and how, um, how about the expert witness? Essentially Good. about Good. fees. Essentially about fees. So thank you, um, Robert. So both parties pay for the uh, arbitration services and the expert witness. 
So for instance, I've mentioned that you would want to know the administrative fees for most arbitration. So most, let's say if it's a 7,000, the Ghana ADR app says we charge 7,000 for every arbitration. What it means is that if there are two parties involved, party A and party B, they pay equally. So party A will pay 3,500, party B will pay 3,500 CDs. Again, that is beside the fee that the arbitrator will charge. The arbitrator will usually at the pre-hearing before the trial, the hearing itself starts, will say that, well, based on the enormity of the case or based on the number of hours that will go into this case, I'm going to charge both of you $20,000, for instance. What it means is that the parties will share that $10,000 equally. If there are three of them, they share it equally. If they are the same with the arbitrator's fee. But normally this is what happens. Normally the arbitrator says, I'm gonna charge 10,000 10, Ghana cities. So what it means is that both parties should pay $5,000, $5,000 each. But then usually, and I normally do that in my arbitration, I say that, look, if you should pay, let's say, before the hearing starts, if one party is not paying his bid, which is the half of it, the other party, so party A can pay all, the full amount, which is $10,000. And then in the course of the award, I would take note of the fact that they failed to pay. So if I was going to even award, give the award in favor of B, the one that didn't pay, and I was going to give that party, let's say, 20000 I would make note in the ruling, in the award that, I take note of the fact that the arbitral fee was solely paid by party, which is 10,000. So instead of the 20,000 that I would have awarded to party B, I'm taking, I'm deducting $5,000 of it. So now party A only owes uh, party B $15,000. So in answer to it, the fees is that it is paid equally by the parties involved, depending on what is charged by this, the arbitral institution and the arbitrator. I think I've seen one that says, what is the minimum fee payable to the arbitrator. It's very difficult to tell. Again, I've told you there are various modes of payments for arbitrators. In fact, I learned in the US where I did uh, most of my arbitration training that, I mean, some arbitrators charge per hour because they look at, for instance, and your experienced arbitrators will probably be charging, let's say $200, $300 an hour, while the amateur ones probably be charging $100 because a lot goes into it. Again, some um, arbitration, arbitral institutions also give you some guidance. The arbitral arbitration test fee will probably be 10% of the amount involved. But for us, even if it is not stated, whether it's by the arbitral institution or ad hoc institution, Act 798, sorry, Act 798, which is on ADR in Ghana, if you look at fees, fees is regulated under Section 22 of the Act. It says that it doesn't, it gives you parameters for determining what the fees should be. And I'm, I know that all these arbitral institutions are aware of the effects of section 22. So you cannot charge in vacuum. You cannot charge as it were, you know, as it, without consideration of these parameters. And one of the parameters are under section 22 include that the time involved, the enormity of the case, etc. Again, you asked about witness, the, uh, the expert witness, if you bring that expert witness, you pay that expert witness. So I won't be able to tell you what is the minimum fee payable to arbitrator because it depends on arbitrator to arbitrator. Yes. Absolutely. Maybe I, I can come in. Sure. Uh, I think the issue of fees is one that is very important, particularly for attorneys. I've been appointed, you know, to sit as arbitrator in about three different arbitrations that did not proceed because of fees. Mm. Uh, one I actually wanted badly, uh, given the nature of the dispute and the amount involved in the claim, right? Mm -hmm. But parties are not just ready uh, to pay that huge amount. Uh, yeah. I know that if it is not institutional arbitration, what we do typically is to charge ad valorem, looking based on the value of the claim. Yeah. And so the parties are not ready to pay. I wanted to maintain a professional stance, uh, mm. you know, of okay, well, but. Even arbitrators fees can be negotiated, right? You can negotiate yeah, with the arbitrators definitely. and um, you know they can decide to you know come down on fees. But for SMEs, uh, which is why you know institutions like the Ghana ADR app uh, up and the Ghana Arbitration Center, they have uh, sometimes dedicated um, you know packages for SMEs mm -hmm. yes. on small scale arbitration, you know, where uh, the fees of arbitrators are capped. Mm -hmm. So you know that if you are yeah, a five million naira claim. Uh, the fees are capped, so um, it makes it affordable for SMEs you know, to be right. able to and resolve their disputes amicably. Thank right. you, Prof. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Yes. Next question. So, next question is that 
If you want to become a member of the Ghana ADR Hub, is there any membership fees? As the vice president, I'm sure um, mm. you should be able to answer this. Yeah, definitely. So again, I if you go to our website, there's the Ghana ADR .org, or you can Google Ghana ADR, you know, that we have a, a list of the types of membership that we have. We start from the student membership, which is free for all tertiary um, stu um, students, tertiary institutions, um, students of tertiary institutions that are interested in all forms of ADR. So they, their membership is free. And um, we have a membership, I think it ranges from uh, 250 cities for associate member. We have member and then up all the way to fellow. Of, and of course, for us, your membership is also distinguished by the, 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 the path, whether mediation or arbitration. So if it's your associate member into bracket mediation. So we have all the listed fee, but it starts from um, student membership which is free and then it goes to associate membership, which is 250, 500, 750 up onto the fellow, which is thousand. And of course, to be a member, you'd usually be required to take some number of hours of, of training. So for instance, uh, the basic one, which I know from us, um, I mean, which I can readily tell you now with the associate member is that at least we run um, courses, 40 hour courses for both links, mediation and arbitration. So you would be required to um, take these courses online or in, in person, depending on how the COVID situation runs, and then you are now certified. Also, the Ghana ADR usually receives, um, if you have certificates from other institutions, like if you're a CI member or you join Yongika LCI, and we, you, you, you show us, you finish us with a um, certificate and we verify and know that you've run those courses with that particular arbitration. So sometimes we jump you from particular rank of membership. So you probably start off with, let's say, membership, a member straight, um, straight away instead of starting with associate member all the way to fellowship, etc. So yes, and I would encourage you to look more. So there are fees, quite nominal fees. The advantages of payment of these fees is that we share with you our newsletters and upcoming training, some of our training, because you remember, you get huge discounts to join those um, those trainings, uh, et cetera. And of course, one of the, it's easier to be listed as an arbitrator, for instance, at the Ghana AD Hub, when you have been a member, because we're able to um, verify and confirm that you've had the requisite training and can now um, migrate from just being a mere member to in the future, hopefully becoming a listed arbitrator under the Ghana AD One of the things about Ghana AD we also um, um, keep what we call international arbitration, uh, member status okay so we have certain persons who are listed as um, international arbitrators under the Ghana ADR so it's a progression really all with a view to maintaining some standard required of who uh, a member of um, arbitration or mediation or who an arbitrator should be thank you thank, thank you I think you've answered uh, one of the remaining questions on how long does it take to undergo training to become an arbitrator uh, the last one because I don't intend to keep you any longer I know a very busy person uh, is using the listing system. Does, does that entails imposing the arbitrator on the parties and when the parties are unwilling? Right. So again, um, that doesn't. Let me say yes and no, and this I'm going to explain that you see. So the listing process, like I explained to you, usually will give you the list of all arbitrators. And I, the last time I think we had our meeting, if I should count even the international arbitrators, we're looking at about 12, uh, minimum of 12 arbitrators so far, the Ghana ADR. So if you're unable to choose, we give you the list of the 12. So party A takes 12, party B takes 12. So administrator of the hub tells you, okay, so 40, within 14 days, get back to me. List out of the 12, which you prefer. So your most preferred should be number one, up on to what, number 12. And usually you find that there will be a common denominator. Either your preferred one will be, your, your second preferred one will be the first preferred of the other, or even the same second preferred or the third preferred. So you realize that we see some commonality between the two of you. So in a way, uh, um, I don't know if you see that as a position, but where, again, we don't even find, and usually it is hard that you won't find a common denominator, but where you don't, then be, uh, the, the uh, administrator of the Ghana ADA Hub will determine based on what I said to be the highly voted for. 
So if we don't get a common denominator, like let's say all of you chose um, Abayomi as number one, then we'll look at which one is the highly voted for. So in a way, someone may see it as imposition, but I, I, I do not tend to see it as imposition because it's also part of your, of your preference. Thank you again for that excellent presentation, uh, Diana. And we wish you the very best in your new role. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And I believe that the, this seminar will provide opportunity to enable uh, more people who want to ask follow-up questions, of course, from the ac <laughs> academy and your friends here. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And special thanks to all the participants for taking our time uh, to attend the training today. I hope you found the sessions useful and rewarding. And you know, we're grateful to GIZ Ghana, uh, the Africa Arbitration Academy, for the great support you know, that they've, they've provided to us in putting together this training. Um, just to note that certificate of attendance uh, you know, will be issued by the Africa Arbitration Academy to all attendees. So please send to us your full names, the way you want those names to appear on the certificate, and we will send to you um, your certificates in due course and also complete the survey at the end of the session uh, because we'd like to have your, your feedback. Um, there's another training in June, at the end of June, on online dispute resolution that will be, that has been specially packaged for you and that will keep you apprised you know, of the training dates and the activities in, in due course. So enjoy the rest of your day. If you have any questions, please send to us at info, uh, info at pensburylaw.com and um, we will surely uh, respond to all your questions. So enjoy the rest of your day. Take care and goodbye.